Hello, and welcome to my presentation on the reception of ancient Egypt in Star Trek. This is actually a topic I wanted to do for a couple of years now, but never got the chance to do so. So I'm very grateful to the organizers for having me at this interesting conference and compelling me to finally talk about the topic. Now, since we have a wide range of interest in science fiction at this conference, and I assume not everybody is aware of what Star Trek is actually all about, we're going to start with a general introduction to Star Trek. So Star Trek is essentially an imagination of the future of our species, and thus far mainly set in the 23rd and 24th centuries. It depicts uh, a united Earth that has overcome its petty differences and finally got its act together as a member of a United Nations-like interstellar federation called the United Federation of Planets. And Earth society is uh, portrayed as a de facto communist society. Material ones, poverty, illnesses, early death have been eliminated and individuals strive to better themselves and the collectives and there is no money. So it's essentially this super utopia. Uh, the stories mainly revolve around members and crews of the military arm of the United Federation of Planets, the Starfleet, and are usually set aboard starships, mainly iterations of the starship called Enterprise. The main task of Starfleet is peaceful exploration and first contact with other species, essentially encountering the unknown. And in all of that, armed conflict is the last resort and shunned by all members of the Federation. Star Trek is originally television-based and, uh, and dealt with encounters or moral issues on a weekly basis. So historically, Star Trek is mainly about episodic storytelling. More recent iterations of Star Trek have adopted a serialized storytelling approach with season-long story arcs, but ultimately all the stories are about the exploration of human existence. What does it mean to be human? How do we overcome our challenges? Things like that. Uh, the original purpose, according to the creator Gene Roddenberry, was to show that humanity can do better in the future, that we should see past our petty differences and get our act together to create or to strive toward this utopian future that Star Trek would uh, like us to see, achieve in the future. The setting in the future as such is uh, simply a means to bypass US Cold War censorship in the 1960s though. At the time, during the height of the Cold War, it was very difficult to discuss matters like uh, racism or international conflicts or anti-war sentiment. So like all good science fiction, uh, the future and a high-tech environment is simply the hook to discuss pertinent matters of the time. And that continues to this day, essentially. Star Trek has always adapted to discuss and uh, problematize uh, problems that we have in our societies today. When, when I talk about societies, of course, that is mainly through a lens of the United States. Ultimately, it's a US American citizen. Now, uh, considering all these social issues, other alien species often embody negative human traits that the humans in the Star Trek universe have already overcome issues, um, traits like militarism, the search for profits, hubris, and things like that. And together with space phenomena, they embody the unknown that needs to be understood and dealt with. Ultimately, Star Trek promotes uh, something that could be called cosmopolitanism. In the words of Star Trek, it's about infinite diversity in infinite combinations. As I said, Star Trek is mainly television-based, and so far we've had nine TV series, with the original Star Trek, simply called Star Trek, airing in 1966. And uh, yeah, the first six series we can call as we, we, can, we can essentially call it the first wave of Star Trek, with this episodic storytelling and recurring themes. 
This wave stopped in the mid-2000s. After that, there was a hiatus of more than 10 years before Star Trek would reappear on the small screen. And in, in the more recent incarnations, Star Trek has become considerably darker. And the utopia of the Federation has moved toward uh, yeah, well, what we can consider a dystopia. And several of the positive aspects of the Federation have been retconned in one way or another. This is, of course, to, to highlight the changes in Western or the United States society at the time, and Star Trek problematizes these issues. We also have more than a dozen Star Trek feature films thus far, but we're not going to talk about those because Ancient Egypt virtually plays no role in those. Instead, we're going to look at several instances where Ancient Egypt features one way or another in the television episodes of the different series, and we're going to kick that off just now. Since I'm doing this chronologically, we start with the original Star Trek from the 1960s, and our first example is from the episode The City on the Edge of Forever. Here the Enterprise crew land on a planet where they encounter this device, which actually turns out to be a life form, a sentient being, calling itself the Guardian of Forever, and ultimately it's a, a time-traveling device because it can transport whoever steps through it to any point in the universe at any at any time. And uh, the being makes its point to the Enterprise crew by showing them pictures from Earth's past, uh, starting off with images from what's supposed to be ancient Egypt, where the Giza plateau. So here ancient Egyptian imagery serves to contextualize the, uh, the position of the characters and Earth in the, in the universe. The next example, more indirectly though, is from the episode Patterns of Force. Here the Enterprise crew encounters an alien society which is heavily modeled after National Socialist Germany, replete with the corresponding imagery and symbolism. And this episode is ultimately about the problem how absolute power absolutely corrupts. And the Vulcan first officer, Spock, points out to Dr. Leonard McCoy here how uh, absolute power corrupting absolutely, or rather men searching absolute power, was a recurring feature of human history. And alongside corrupted absolute rulers, Spock cites individuals like Alexander, Caesar, Napoleon, Hitler, and alongside those he mentions one Ramses. Now we can only guess that it's, that's supposed to be Ramses II or Ramses the Great. Anyway, ancient Egypt here serves to underpin once again the point of the characters and humanity in the 23rd century, showing where humanity has come from, a very violent, very corrupted societies, to a brighter future. Our next example, and this time Egypt features only indirectly through uh, ultimately Egyptian design, is from the episode The Paradise Syndrome. Here on this planet, where the society akin to North American Plains Indians, they encounter this structure, which is obviously inspired by an obelisk. And they refer to this structure as an obelisk, which also has glyph-like writing on it, which is then deciphered later. Anyway, this obelisk turns out to be a protective device uh, emitting a deflector beam that deflects uh, incoming asteroids threatening to destroy the planet. The next example is from the animated series, which continues the original Star Trek. Uh, here the Enterprise crew encounters the god Kukul Khan, which turns out to be simply an alien life form, and it presents them with uh, problems and riddles that they need to solve, and they Kukul Khan transports some crew members to its home planet, which, uh, as we can see, is unifies several distinct styles that we can see in um, pre-modern Earth societies, like 
what they say is Egyptian elements like these columns we see on the left, uh, the Mesoamerican elements. And these columns on the left, uh, well, Captain James D. Kirk actually says that these remind him of Egyptian obelisks. Obviously, these are not obelisks because they are rather Egyptian style columns. But anyway, within the series, they consider it to be obelisks before another crew member points out that the writing, though, the hieroglyphs on it is not Egyptian, but rather something else. Uh, another Egyptian element, if we look at the picture on the right here, we might think about these donk-like figures and uh, yeah, ask the question whether they might be inspired by Anubis or Upuaut. You, you get what I mean. So anyway, Egypt here has features as a design element rather than a plot device or anything else. Now on to the original series set 100 years later in the 24th century. Here the Enterprise crew encounter the creator, one of the major crew members, Lieutenant Commander Data, who happens to be an emotionless android. In the laboratory or home of, of his father or creator, uh, there are several different things collected from Earth's history, like dinosaur fossils or historical artifacts and all sorts of books. Among those, there is the bust of an Egyptian pharaoh, replete with a Nemes headdress. And here, of course, the, the function of this object, together with all the others, is to make the point that the creator of Lieutenant Commander Data is none other than a resident renaissance man, a learned man, a genius who takes in all sorts of knowledge. We're going to come back to this later. In the next generation episode, Eye of the Beholder, they use the early dynastic stela of the Egyptian ruler, Watch or Jet, as an alien artifact from the homeworld of an alien crew member who had just committed suicide. Now, of course, this serves to underpin alienness once again. In the Star Trek Voyager episode Memorial, the Voyager crew encounters this obelisk-shaped structure, which also has glyphs which inform the visitors of an armed conflict several centuries ago, where atrocities were committed on all sides of the parties. But this is not just a normal memorial, uh, it is rather a um, highly sophisticated technological device which implants the memories of participants in this war in travelers who happen to pass through the solar system. Um, so once again, Egypt does not feature directly here, but rather through its imagery as an alien design element. And in the Star Trek Enterprise episode, Cold Front, set 100 years before the original series in the 22nd century, um, a temporal agent from the distant future informs one of the main characters, Captain Jonathan Archer of the Starship Enterprise, about a temporal Cold War, about factions from the future trying to alter events in the past to prevent the creation of the United Federation of Planets and thus the glorious future of our human species. So uh, to, to make a point uh, how time travel works in the future, he points out that a group of anthropologists from the future was just now observing the construction of the Great Pyramid in Giza in 2769 BCE. Now on to our last tangible example from the pilot episode of the series Star Trek Discovery, one of the more recent Star Trek series, which I mentioned have a somewhat darker outline and darker themes than uh, the original run of Star Trek series. And here we can see a reimagination of one of the major Star Trek villains, the Klingons. And this is actually a Klingon burial scene where we can see a Klingon warrior encased in an anthropomorphic or Klingonomorphic sarcophagus and actually wrapped in, in linen. So this definitely, or it's obvious that this harkens back to Egyptian burial customs. But of course, we don't know why the producers decided to adopt this particular burial style for the Klingons. 
talking about the Klingons. Um, and a behind the scenes special about the end of the run of Star Trek The Next Generation, uh, the show mentions that the design of the Klingon High Council, the political center of the Klingon Empire, was inspired by ancient Egypt. But to be honest, I don't really see how. Maybe any one of you can point me to that. Um, I rather consider the entire arrangement as such more reminiscent of the Kremlin, but I'm obviously open for discussion here. Maybe I'm just too blind to see it. Now to summarize the function of ancient Egypt in Star Trek. I think I have identified two main functions. The primary function is that of world building and offering context, you know, determining the place of Earth in the universe and the place of the characters in our expanded history, basically dealing with the question, where do we come from and how far have we come? The secondary function is uh, as a marker of alienness, Egyptian elements serving as alien yet familiar designs underpinning the multicultural cosmopolitan reality of the Federation and the universe, as well as the encounter with the unknown. Uh, Egypt generally forms part of the wider engagement with history and exoarchaeology, exoarchaeology being archaeology in places other than Earth. Uh, of course, Star Trek uh, and Egyptian elements play with ancient astronauts theory like a lot of other science fiction and in fact in Star Trek all species have a common uh, genetic origin in the distant past. Uh, at that ancient Egypt does not serve as a plot device. Uh, generally though uh, it, it's taken from the the western aesthetic repertoire you know merging or bashing together all sorts of things perceived as precursors of Western civilization like Egypt, Mesopotamia, and especially Rome and Greece, both of which are way more visible in Star Trek production design than Egypt in turn. Now toward the end of the presentation, a few post-colonial critiques directed at Star Trek one of the major criticisms is that the Federation and Starfleet are seemingly dominated by humans who happen to be mostly white and English speaking, although uh, Star Trek has always been lauded for its relative diversity, considering the, uh, the wider trends of society and diversity has been increasing in the past few years. Uh, another criticism is that the Federation is basically a continuation of European Colonialism, it uh, lords exploration and technological progress for its, for their own sake. It promoted liberal values and patronized less developed societies and withholding technology and knowledge under certain circumstances. Uh, and generally, we, we can trace a line between European frontier myths, which uh, was crucial for the colonization of especially North America, to Star Trek. Um, of course, this rather connects with John F. Kennedy's call to uh, break through the final frontier in the early 1960s, go to the moon, go to the space and all that. Anyway, in, in Star Trek, we have the famous taglines, space the final frontier and to boldly go where no one has gone before. Um, at that, archaeology, or not to say exo-archaeology, are one of the important plot devices in Star Trek, though. And within Star Trek, oh, I have to mention that one of the major characters, Captain Jean-Luc Picard of the Next Generation, is a hobby archaeologist. And had he not joined Starfleet, he once said he would have become an archaeologist, rather. Anyway, archaeology is depicted through well-known tropes, decontextualized objects, de deciphering dead languages, antiquarianism, like we've seen in the laboratory of Lieutenant Commander Data's creator. And uh, these objects are often linked to alien mythologies. Uh, at times, uh, we can see the procurement of archaeological artifacts through Indiana Jones-style methods, so quite colonial, very early 20th century. Uh, overall, uh, literature has identified a rather uncritical reception of archaeological practices, that is, colonial practices in outer space, basically. And uh, another final criticism directed is that the ideal of the Federation and Earth as a utopia does not extend beyond its borders. 
So uh, we rather have the well-known conflicts we can see on our planet, uh, like war and imperialism, rather on the margins of the Federation, in the contact zones with other factions. So we basically talk about old-fashioned international relations in galactic politics. And if we look at uh, one rendition of, uh, of the political situation in the galaxy in the uh, second half of the 24th century, it looks very Westphalian with the rather uh, hard boundaries that are uh, highly delineated against one another. So yes, it's basically, we basically see the, the adoption of Western international relations theory in Star Trek. So, to conclude anything, as I said, Egypt has a world-building mechanism. It contextualizes Earth history and the characters, but also crucially signifies alienness. It's not a plot device thus far. It might change in the future, we will see. Uh, that Egypt itself is delinked from the colonial practices of exoarchaeology because its exoarchaeology is not, does not deal with human archaeology. Of course, the, the idea that Egyptian design is a marker of, of the exotic or the alien rather pertains to Western colonial imaginations. Um, overall, it has the function, though, that to underpin that humanity has both come far, but also still has some way to go toward a brighter future. And, um, and it signifies the diversity of humanity and the universe. And now, thank you very much for listening in. I've taken a bit too much of your time, but anyway, thank you very much. Live long and prosper.